What's up everyone, June with the Sushi Man here, and today we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about Japanese sake. So next time you're eating out at a sushi restaurant, you won't be intimidated by that sake list and know exactly what to order, which will make your dining experience that much better. And if you enjoy drinking sake, especially with sushi, then you'll find my book to be very helpful. It's called How to Make Sushi at Home, a fundamental guide for beginners and beyond. I have an entire chapter on drinks and sushi pairings, and not only for Japanese sake, but wine, beer, whiskey, cocktails, you name it, it's on there. Check out the description below if you're interested. All right, now let's jump right in. Now really quick before we start, for those that like digital downloads, I have created an ultimate sake guide that compiles everything that I'm about to share with you now into one convenient sheet. I'll show parts of it as I go along, but if you want your own copy, click on that link in the description below. And it's totally free, so why not, right? All right, moving on. So sake can get very complicated, but I'm not making a documentary on Netflix here, so I'm going to try to keep it simple and go over just the important things you need to know, which I've broken down into five parts. One, what is sake? Two, types of sake. Three, general flavor profiles and pairings. Four, how to read a sake label. And five, how to serve sake. So very first, we have to cover what sake is. Sake is a type of alcohol that's made from rice, water, yeast, and koji, which is a mold used to convert starches into sugar. And actually the word sake or osake is a general term we use for all alcohol. So beer, wine, whiskey, gin, vodka, even moonshine, whatever drink that has alcohol in it is technically sake. The correct word usage is actually nihonshu, which translates to Japanese alcohol. But you'll hear me using both terms throughout the video since most people refer to it as sake, at least here in the States. And as you've been hearing me, it's pronounced sake, not sake, or even worse, sake. Please don't do that. For your own sake. Now you probably heard of sake being called a rice wine, and that's because, well, sake is made of rice, and a lot of times the alcohol content is similar to wine, on average about maybe 12 to 20%. But the process of making sake is actually closer to that of brewing beer. It's a very intricate and strenuous procedure and these sake brewers take years upon years to master the craft. But I won't go into detail here, maybe in a future video. However, there is one important part of the process we need to cover, and that is rice polishing. And this leads us into part two, the types of sake. Now, before we dive deeper into the rice polishing process, I want to quickly go over the two main categories of Nihonshu which are junmai and non-junmai. Junmai means pure rice, and is sake brewed using only rice, water, yeast, and koji. Non-junmai uses the same four ingredients, but adds some distilled brewer's alcohol into it. Now, adding extra alcohol into something as pure as Nihonshu may sound bad, but that's not always the case. These master brewers are meticulous and have perfected this process where the final product tastes just as good, if not even better than junmai sake. But that's up to you to decide. Anyways, just remember the difference because you'll see the word junmai a lot on sake bottles. All right, now that we know the two main categories of sake, let's go back to the rice polishing process. So as I mentioned, sake is made from four main ingredients, rice, water, yeast, and koji. All of these ingredients are crucial, but the primary one that determines the type of sake is the rice. And in order to use the rice for sake, first, the outer layers have to be milled away. Why? Because it doesn't taste good at least when making sake. And the more you take away, the higher the quality and usually more expensive. And this is all represented with a number called semai buai or polishing ratio and sometimes called rice remaining ratio. It's a percentage and as you can tell by the name, it's how much of the rice is remaining after the polishing process. And basically what you need to know is that the lower that number is, the more premium the sake. Which takes us to this chart. And this is part of the ultimate sake guide I mentioned. You can see here on the left, the higher it goes, the more premium. So anything with the word daiginjo is the cream of the crop and is usually the most prized bottle of the sake brewery. And these require a polishing ratio number of 50% or less, meaning half or more of that rice had to have been milled away. Next, we have ginjo and junmai ginjo. These have a requirement of 60% or less polishing ratio. So 40% or more had to have been milled away. And then non-junmai sake that's 70% or less is called honjozo, while junmai sake from that 70% point is just called junmai. And this tsushu or table sake is usually meant for cooking, and there's really no minimum requirement. 
Not the best to drink. I mean, I guess you could, but I wouldn't recommend it. All right, I try to keep that as simple as possible. And if you take anything away from it, just remember the lower that polishing ratio number is, the higher the quality. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll like it better, which leads us into part three, flavor profiles and pairings. Like any other type of alcohol, it's nearly impossible to pinpoint a flavor profile to one type. There's just so much variety, which is a great thing. So just understand that these are typical characteristics, but it can vary greatly depending on the bottle you get. And ultimately, it's what you like. So we'll start off from the top, Daiginjo and Junmai Daiginjo. Remember, these are the high-end, super premium bottles which tend to be more pricey. Great for celebrations, a gift, or maybe you're trying to impress someone. Or buy yourself at the sushi bar. Hey, it's good for any occasion if you ask me. These are elegant and complex. They're usually pretty fragrant with some refined fruit flavors and a hint of umami on the back end. It's definitely my go-to and it's pretty rare for me to be disappointed with them. There's a lot going on in a subtle and balanced way, which you typically don't want to overpower with heavy tasting food. Light Asian dishes, shellfish, and of course sushi and sashimi are great pairings, especially any white fish like hirame, tai, or kampachi. But you might want to avoid the deep fried stuff, especially if it's doused in sauces. All right, next up is the ginjo and junmai ginjo. These are usually crowd pleasers and very well balanced. It's typically pretty floral and has a fruity, light, and clean taste to it. It's perfect if you're ordering a bottle for a group or if you have a bunch of different types of food. That said, really rich flavored food can overpower it, but other than that, it's a great complement to a ton of different dishes, sushi and sashimi included. Okay, next we have your regular junmai. These are more full bodied and rich, and you'll get more of that earthiness. Also, a lot of them have a little more acidity to them. And because of the fuller flavor to these, you can usually pair it with heavier seasoned food. Think like fried chicken, red meats, yakitori, tempura, katsu, anything with teriyaki basically, fatty meats like pork belly, fried rice, I mean the list can go on and on. Sushi wise you can match it with those crazy rolls. Deep fried, bunch of sauce on top, spicy things can be a good match as well. Alright, last one is the honjozo. Now remember this is similar to the regular junmai but it adds that brewer's alcohol. And you would think that by adding that extra alcohol in there that it would be more harsh, but it actually makes it lighter and easier to drink and tends to have a cleaner finish. That's the magic of those brewers. Pairing wise, it goes well with a wide range of dishes. So again, a great one if you're planning to eat a variety of food. All different types of sushi, tempura, shabu shabu, steaks, spicy food. I mean, you could really try it with whatever. All right, now again, this is a very broad and general overview, which you can use as a good baseline but it really comes down to your own personal preference. So keep trying different things and most importantly, have fun while you do it. All right, let's move on to part four, how to read a sake label. I wanted to go over this because I get asked about the label a lot, but I'm gonna keep it really short because nowadays you can simply pull out your phone and Google the name of the sake and get everything you need to know from there. And most of these bottles will have the description in English now, especially the more popular ones. Like these bottles all have English translations on the back. Now that said, the typical information on a sake label are going to be, and not all labels will have these, but the name of the sake, obviously, the type, so Junmai Dai Ginjo, Ginjo, Honjozo, whatever, alcohol content, where it was brewed, the polishing ratio, recommended serving temperature, and sometimes what's called the SMV value and acidity level. And that last one is what I want to talk about for a bit. The SMV, which stands for sake meter value, also known as Nihon Shudo, is a measuring system for how sweet or dry the sake is. Not all labels will list it, but if you see a negative or plus number on there, then that's what that is. Like this Kurosawa, for example. I think it has it on the back. Yeah, plus two. I don't know if you can see it, but. Most of the sake that we've gone over is between negative 15 to plus 15. Now, some types of sake such as Nigori can have really low SMV, around negative 50 even. But all you need to know is that the lower the number, the sweeter, and the higher the number, the drier. There's also a number you may see which typically ranges from 1.0 to 2.0, and that is the acidity level. All you need to know here is that the lower the acidity, the lighter and crisp, while higher acidity value means the sake is more rich and robust. So you can see how with just these two numbers, you can figure out the general flavor profile of that particular sake. But some bottles will have a flavor chart on there instead, it's a little circular diagram with like a crosshair and it makes it easier to tell the flavor profile. Like this Dasai 45 has one here. Let me try to get this so that you can see. 
but basically this tells you the same thing. And don't worry, all of this information is on that ultimate psychic guide sheet, which you could get with that link in the description. Okay, let's move on to our final part, how to serve sake. In this section, I'm going to go over two things. First, the temperature sake should be served, and then second, the type of vessel that can be used. So sake is one of the very few types of alcohol that doesn't taste like crap when heated up. I don't know about you, but thinking about drinking hot wine, beer, or whiskey sounds pretty awful. Now that doesn't mean that you should just heat up any type of sake. Actually, you'll have a better experience overall going the other way by chilling it, especially with more premium bottles. However, going either direction too far will ruin the flavor. Now check out this diagram on the different sake temperatures. There's actually really cool names for each, ranging from 23 degrees all the way up to 133 degrees. And if you read over here on the right, you'll see how the temperature can affect the flavor profile of the sake. So by chilling the sake, you get a crisper and cleaner flavor while it also enhances those ginjo characteristics, such as fruitiness and fragrance. But when chilled too much, it can lose those delicate flavors and aroma and sometimes bring out more bitterness. Warming it up on the other hand will bring out rich and more umami flavors while making it more full body as well. But heating it up too much will increase the alcohol intensity and dryness. Hot vodka anyone? I personally find the sweet spot to be right around that hanahie or the chilled spring flower. Sounds delightful just by the name, doesn't it? Especially when it comes to daiginjos and ginjos, which I always drink chilled, never heated. Heating premium bottles like that usually just ruins it because all those delicate flavors and aroma gets erased. But if you enjoy hot sake, then I recommend using something cheaper like a regular junmai or honjozo. Don't waste your money on a super premium bottle just to kill it. Now, a great way to see what temperature you like is to chill a bottle and then start drinking your way up. A typical fridge is usually right under about 40 degrees, Fahrenheit that is. So start from there and then let it warm up in room temp as you take sips or gulps or shot it if you want. Hey, you might not even care about the temperature after a while. Anyways, that's serving temperature in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the vessel. There are many ways you can serve sake and there's not really a right or wrong. Most common though is going to be a tokkuri and ochoko. This is called a tokkuri, basically a craft and it's just a way to transfer sake from a larger bottle and make it more convenient to pour into these little ochokos, which are these little shot glass looking things. There's a ton of different styles and they're made from different materials as well. Glass, porcelain. This one's pretty cool because it has these little nigirizushi pictures on here. This one's ceramic, I believe. And sometimes wood. This is a tokkuri made out of bamboo. And I think this one's porcelain or ceramic. I'm actually not really sure. Now, if you're drinking cold sake, then you could pretty much use any of these. But if you plan on heating it up, just make sure you're using one that's heat safe, like this ceramic one or one that's porcelain, never glass. And if you want to learn how to properly heat up sake, then check out this short video that I made. Okay, going back to cold sake. You can also use something simple like a wine glass. It's actually preferred when it comes to tastings because it helps bring out the aromas better. Another vessel you might have seen before is what's called a masu, which is this wooden box usually made out of Japanese cedar or cypress, also known as hinoki. It was actually used to measure out rice back in the old days. Sometimes restaurants or bars will put a glass cup in here and then pour the sake so that it purposely overflows into the masu. It's basically an act to show generosity and a way to thank you for your friendship or business. Typically, we won't use this at home though. It's more for show or in a celebration setting. But they're pretty cool and has a great smell to them. And it can also be a great decorative piece. All right, that is about it. Now, for those that are curious about the types of sake that I have here, I'll list them in the description along with my notes on each one. All right, good job making it this far. Now, there's so much more to sake and I really only cover the very tip of it, but I hope that now you understand and appreciate sake more, which in turn gives you a better experience. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So go get some good food, surround yourself with people you love, and open up a bottle. I hope you enjoyed the video and don't forget to like and subscribe if you found it helpful. I'll see you in the next one. Come back.